Well, let me welcome us as um, others are gathering, and we begin with some words from the book of Joshua. Joshua, at the end of his life, looking back on the goodness of God and looking forward to the future, says this, you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass. Not one of them has failed. So let's praise God together as we sing our opening hymn, which is number 238, here on the threshold of a new beginning. By grace forgiven, now we leave behind our long-repented selfishness and sinning, and all our blessings call again to mind. Number 238. Now let's pray together. 
Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Our great and our good God, Lord of the past, of the present, and of the future, who has revealed yourself in Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday and today and forever. We come in the early, year, early days of this new year to praise and thank you for all that is past and to ask for your continued blessing in the days to come. As we have sung, we are on the threshold of a new beginning, new opportunities, new hopes, new possibilities, and yet new fears, new anxieties, new problems. But we know that you are faithful, not just sometimes, not even most of the time. You are faithful to all eternity. And so we thank you for this new opportunity to meet together, to praise your name, to hear your word. We come from different backgrounds, different nations, different um, situations. We come from a, a huge variety of um, age groups, of kinds of people, and yet knowing that in your fullness in glory in Christ Jesus, you're able to meet all of our needs. And we come as sinners. We know that um, at the beginning of the year, the temptation is to make resolutions, and by this time in the new year, they're almost always broken. And so we come depending on your grace. We come asking that you will forgive our sins. We come knowing that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts through the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, let me welcome you once again, whether you're in this part of the building or elsewhere. It's good to see you, and if you're a visitor particularly, you are most welcome. We trust that you'll be greatly blessed as we meet together. And let me take this opportunity to wish everyone a happy new year. I know that it's, we're a few days into the new year, but this is the first time we've met together as a fellowship, so... I pray that this will be a year of opportunity, a year of God's blessing, a year of great things opening up ahead of us. Now, you won't have a notice sheet this morning. There's one or two things I would like to draw to your attention, though. We meet again this evening, and Paul Brennan will be preaching, so if you're able to come, that would be great. The primary and junior Sunday school young people leave during the second hymn, one or two things are not beginning yet this week. The ladies' Bible study begins on Monday, the 20th of January. That's two weeks tomorrow. There's no lunchtime Bible talk and no small groups this Wednesday. <clears throat> Friday, however, at 10.15, mainly music, and also on Friday at 5 for 5.30, Activate and Tron Youth. Next Sunday morning, once again, at 11 and at 6.30. Now, Alison's also asked me to mention that Betty McPherson, one of our elderly members, died this past week. The details of the funeral, which is held on th will be held on Thursday morning, can be had from the office. The office will be open again as from tomorrow, so if you're intending to be there, then please contact the office. A couple of other things... Um, Oh, yes. You should never bring loads of paper with you when you're making announcements because you almost always miss something out or get something wrong. However, the Gospel Partner calendars are available, and I think the apprentices, is that right, Josh? You're only apprentice, I can see at the moment. They're available from the apprentices. And also, Christianity Explored begins on Friday the 24th, and, and there are cards available outside. Now, 
as always, with some relief, um, I come to the end of the announcements. <laughs> now, we'll come to, we come now to our Bible reading, and we are, we're resuming once again our studies in the book of Jeremiah, and we're reading in Jeremiah chapter 30, which is on page 657. Jeremiah chapter 30, which is, uh, you'll find on page 657. And 57. <clears throat> Jeremiah 30, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will bring them back to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall take possession of it. These are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. Thus says the Lord, we have heard a cry of pain, of panic, of terror and no peace. Ask now and see, can a man bear a child? Why then do I see every man with his hands on his stomach, like a woman in labor? Why has every face turned pale? Alas, that day is so great, there is none like it. It is a time of distress for Jacob, yet he shall be saved out of it." And it shall come to pass in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off your neck, and I will burst your bonds, and foreigners shall no more make a servant of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Then fear not, O Jacob, my servant, declares the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from far away and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return and have quiet and ease, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with you to save you, declares the Lord. <clears throat> I will make a full end of all the nations among whom I scattered you, but of you I will not make a full end. I will discipline you in just measure, and I will by no means leave you unpunished. For thus says the Lord, your hurt is incurable, and your wound is grievous. There is none to uphold your cause, no medicine for your wound, no healing for you. All your lovers have forgotten you, they care nothing for you. For I have dealt you the blow of an enemy, the punishment of a merciless foe. Because your guilt is great, because your sins are flagrant, why do you cry out over your hurt? Your pain is incurable. Because your guilt is great, because your sins are flagrant, I have done these things to you. Therefore, all who devour you shall be devoured, and all your foes, every one of them, shall go into captivity. Those who plunder you shall be plundered, and all who prey on you I will make a prey. For I will restore health to you, and your wounds I will heal, declares the Lord, because they have called you an outcast. It is Zion for whom no one cares. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob and have compassion on his dwellings. The city shall be rebuilt on its mound and the palace shall stand where it used to be. Out of them shall come songs of thanksgiving and the voices of those who celebrate. I will multiply them and they shall not be few. I will make them honored and they shall not be small. Their children shall be as they were of old, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all who oppress them. Their prince shall be one of themselves. Their ruler shall come out of their midst. I will make him draw near, and he shall approach me. For who would dare of himself to approach me, declares the Lord. And you shall be my people, and I will be your God." Behold, the storm of the Lord, wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest. It will burst upon the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intentions of his mind. 
In the latter days, you will understand this. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. This is the gospel of the Lord, indeed predicted by Jeremiah. And that's what we're going to sing about now, number 632. We have a gospel to proclaim, good news for all throughout the earth. <clears throat> No, we're going to have a break for a few minutes as we take up the offering.
Now let's pray. Prophet Isaiah said, Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And so, everlasting God, the Creator of the ends of the earth, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bring together our need and your plenty, our helplessness and your strength, our mortality and your eternity, our sin and your grace. We trust that um, the, these great words from the prophet will strengthen our hearts as we go forward into the future. I bring to you this world at the beginning of the year. We know a change of calendar does not mean that problems are removed and that difficulties vanish. We remember the many, many, the, the many, many situations in the world which continue to continue to develop and indeed continue to worsen in some places. The, the continuing agony in Syria, in the other killing fields of the world, where people hate each other and, and um, worship violence and bloodshed and refuse to live peaceably together. We know that until the Prince of Peace returns and sets up his kingdom, there will never be permanent peace, and yet we ask for those countries, the kind of peace and stability we have in our own country, the kind of freedoms we still enjoy, freedom to meet, the freedom to speak, the freedom to, to do so many things that we take as part of daily life. And in this country, once again, we have been reminded of our own vulnerability, our helplessness in the face of the elements and when humanity tends to become conceited and think that it has enthroned itself over everything, we know that uh, against the power of the elements we are helpless. But we do pray, Lord, for those whose homes and whose livelihoods have been destroyed during these terrible floods. We pray you will help the rescue services and the emergency services so that normal life can resume and continue. We pray for your church, Lord. We pray for the church worldwide, in some places vigorous and growing, in other places weak and faltering. And yet we know that throughout the earth you have never left yourself without a witness. Pray for our own fellowship here at the beginning of this year. We pray that as you lead us forward into the unknown future, that you will continue to bless us. In the words of the to him we, pray, we praise you for all that is past and trust you for all that's to come. Pray for our young people. Thank you for them, Lord. We pray for them as many return to university and college and school, as others go into work, Lord. We, we pray that the, you will continue to guide them and to strengthen them. You will bring into their lives the people and the influences that will cause them to grow that you will shield them from the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And indeed, we pray this for us all because we know, Father, that temptation is something that dogs us all our Christian lives. And so we pray, Lord, that you will indeed strengthen your people in this world, in this world of so many temptations and so many difficulties. And we pray, Lord, as we, as we come to your word, we all come with different needs and different longings. We all come needing to hear different things. And yet we know that by your Spirit, through your Word, that you can speak to each one of us. And we pray, Lord, that when we come to your Word, that the words spoken by the ancient prophet may become the living Word spoken to us at the beginning of this new year. Let's have a moment of silence while we bring to the Lord someone or some situation.
is very much on our hearts. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power at work among us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and in eternity. Amen. Now, before we look together at the Jeremiah passage, we're going to sing number 553, God in his wisdom for our learning gave his inspired and holy word number 553. Now, if we could have our Bibles open, please, at Jeremiah 30 on page 657. And before we look at the passage, let's have a word of prayer. Were not our hearts burning within us while He talked with us on the way and opened to us the Scriptures? Father, we praise You that when the Lord Christ, by the power of His Spirit, opens His Word to us, it does indeed cause our hearts to burn. No human abilities can do this, and so I pray, Lord, that You will take my human words in all their weakness and imperfection. You will use them faithfully to unfold the written Word, and so lead us to the living Word, Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
I think it's true to say that no one is particularly happy to get a consolation prize. The word consolation always suggests second best. We didn't get what we wanted, we didn't get what we hoped for, we didn't get what we felt we deserved, and so we get this consolation prize. And it's very unfortunate that this section of Jeremiah we are beginning, this is chapters 30 to 33, is called by the commentators the book of consolation, because that does suggest to me the book of the second best almost as if God is saying to his people, well, you've blown it. You made a mess of it. Can't give you what I'd hoped to give you. They'll give you something to compensate for it. This is not the book of consolation. This is the book of the glorious promises of God. Now, I'm not imagining for one moment that anyone remembers what I said on Jeremiah 29 back in August. Indeed, I couldn't remember it myself. I had, to re- I had to reread my notes when I was preparing chapter 30. So, you'll forgive me if I take a few minutes to place Jeremiah in context, um, just so that we know where we are. Briefly, Jeremiah prophesies in the closing days of the kingdom of Judah before they are taken into exile in Babylon. He prophesies in the reigns of five kings, the, good king, the great reforming King Josiah, whose reforms we know from his book he approved of but felt they had not really made the impact they might have made, and then various short-lived kings, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, and Jehoiakim. Hey, don't mix up your Jehoiakims and, Jeho- and your Jehoiakims. Um, and then the puppet king Zedekiah, installed by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And here, as we know from chapter 32, we're within months of the exile. Within months of this chapter, Nebuchadnezzar is going to destroy the city, burn the temple, take the people off to Babylon in exile. And therefore, Jeremiah's message up to now has been a message of judgment. Back in chapter 1, verse 10, he was told that he was to pluck up to break down, to destroy, and to overthrow. Now, that's not a very cheery message, is it? To pluck up, to break down, to destroy, and to overthrow. Judgment coming, which can't be avoided. But he was also told to build and to plant. In other words, the message of judgment is going to be followed by the message of hope. And we've got that here in these chapters we'll look at over the next few weeks, chapters 30 to 33 and beyond. Back in chapter 29, 11, Jeremiah had said, "The, the Lord has plans for you to give you a future and a hope. Now, these are being developed in, in this section. In this section, we're beginning, and that is a passage that's referred to in the book of Daniel as the exile comes to an end because judgment is never an end in itself. Judgment is there to prepare the way for blessing, Um, repentance to prepare the way for forgiveness. This is where we are in Jeremiah. Jeremiah is probably in prison at this moment. Um, This section is followed by a parallel section which describes the experiences of Jeremiah during these last few few years, few months of, of Jerusalem before it falls. Rather like Paul's great letters from prison, letters like Ephesians and so on, Paul, uh, Jeremiah is looking to the future, looking to the whole story. Verse 3, days are coming. He is looking to the future glory beyond the terrible judgment that's about to engulf the people. Now, that's, I think, enough by way of, of introduction, because I suspect if I had given a long historical ramble about Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim, I would have lost everybody. I may have lost everybody. It is. Anyway, it's, the days are coming, he says. Better days are coming. Now, if you look at the bookends of the chapter, verse 2, write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. And then, this is echoed by John in the book of Revelation, where the risen Lord says, write in a book the things that I show you. And then in the the last verse, um, you will understand this in the latter days. 
In other words, this is not just for Jeremiah's own time, it's for our time as well. Write in a book and you will understand it. And this book is a book of good news. And the title I've given this is the title from Joseph's words in Genesis 50, verse 20, God meant it for good. As Jeremiah looks to the exile and beyond, just as Joseph looks back on his own experience of bitter exile, he speaks the words, God meant it for good. Through judgment, through disaster, through exile, the kingdom will come. And that's what we're going to look at then, this chapter. Three main sections and a fourth as a kind of footnote. When I say footnote, you know that final section is going to be brief, so you can lift up your hearts. First of all, verses 1 to 3, good news to write down. Write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. This isn't just passing good news. This is something that future generations need to hear. Jeremiah had a scribe called Baruch. We meet him in the later chapters. And Paul often mentions people who, who helped him in this way. For example, at the end of Romans, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, Paul had a scribe and amanuensis, and Jeremiah clearly has this man, Baruch, who preserved his sayings, preserved his, his speeches and his sermons. So, good news to write down. Now, that means, first of all, that Jeremiah's words are being authenticated by God. Not just this section, chapters 30 to 33, but the words he's already spoken and the words he is going to speak. Now, remember Jeremiah's words had been ridiculed. They had been mocked. They had, be, they had caused anger and dismay, and he had been persecuted. You see what God is saying, Jeremiah, these words may not have, may not have been accepted, may not have been welcomed by the people to whom you spoke them, but they are going to become part of the permanent record. They are going to be in the Bible. In other words, what God is saying to Jeremiah is not just what he's saying to Jeremiah, what he's saying to us here and now. Heaven and earth will pass away, said Jesus in Matthew 24, but my words will not pass away. Now, so that, that, that's the first thing to notice. Good news to write down. Jeremiah's words are authenticated by God, but also in this little section, verses 1 to 3, God is giving to Jeremiah his view of the exile and beyond. Jeremiah, what I'm going to show to you is the, re is the reality behind this. Days are coming. Now, when you come across this word in the prophet, sometimes in the latter days, this means the, the time when God will visit his people, what the letter to the Hebrews calls the last days. God has spoken to us in the last days in his Son, what will he do in the last days? I will restore the fortunes of my people. Now, the thing to remember about prophecy is prophecy isn't all fulfilled at once. There are various fulfillments before we come to the final fulfillment. That's why prophecy is relevant to every generation. Clearly, Jeremiah is speaking to the people of the time. After all, you can't speak to the people of any other time. You have to speak first and foremost, to the people who are there, to your contemporaries. And what Jeremiah is saying in the first place is the exile will be over and you will return and the city and the temple will be rebuilt. That's the first fulfillment. We read about this in Ezra, Nehemiah, and Haggai. When the people of God returned from Babylon to rebuild, first of all, the temple and then the city. But that's very low-key. And it's quite downbeat. These books actually are, there's a sense of disillusionment in them almost because the great growing prophecies haven't been fulfilled. The desert is not blossoming like the rose. The people are not coming to Zion to hear the word of God, to praise, to praise the God of Israel. Nevertheless, it's an important part of the fulfillment. Malachi, at the end of the Old Testament, says, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Now, there had to be a temple for him to come to. So, that's the first fulfillment. But the second fulfillment, far more spectacular on the day of Pentecost, 
when the prophecies are fulfilled, people from every tribe, language, and nation come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, to celebrate the Exodus, and they hear news of a greater Exodus. They hear news of Jesus Christ, the one who will lead them from darkness and despair into, into new life. So, there's another fulfillment, God's people gathering as the, as the Word is preached. But the ultimate fulfillment is Revelation chapter 7, a fulfillment which is still in the future, where John writes, I saw a great multitude whom no one could count, from every people, language, tribe, and nation, standing around the throne of God and of the Lamb. So you see these different levels of fulfillment. They're all important, but the fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment, lies in the future for us as well. Now, you see, this is very practical. It's not just a theoretical view. It makes sense of the little bit of the story that we are in. We are always, we, we always at any given time are, in, are part of that story, the journey of God's people as they make their way towards the heavenly city. It means, first of all, not to be dismayed if things are going badly. It means that the plan will still work out. It also means not to be proud and conceited if things are going well because the pl it is God who is working out the plan. It is God who is gathering His people. Look at our little bit of the story. Look at the, look at the encouragements, look at the discouragements, and say, well, this is, this is the way it's been. This is the way it will be until the final fulfillment. Good news to be written down. Um, what Peter in his second letter calls a light shining in a dark place, the word of the prophets and the apostles. That is why it is so important if we want genuine encouragement to read our Bibles, because this, this will give us the big picture, the big story. So, that's the first thing. Now, the second, the second movement, if you like, in the chapter is verses 4 to 17. Good news will come after bad news. Do you want the good news or the bad news? Well, Jeremiah doesn't shrink from giving us both and giving us both in full measure. Restoration is going to be a costly business. There is no cheap grace here. Remember, cheap grace was the phrase used by Bonhoeffer, the courageous German pastor murdered by Hitler. Bonhoeffer described cheap grace as Christ without the cross, salvation without repentance. There will be no cheap grace, but there will be grace. And the important thing is, verse 4, the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. All of God's people will return. The northern kingdom had long gone in Jeremiah's time, gone to Assyria a hundred years and more before. The southern kingdom of Judah was about to go. And the great prophets of the exile, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, are always insistent on this. It is the united people of God who will return. No one will be missing. And the name Jacob is hugely significant. Um, verse 7, a time of distress for Jacob. Verse 10, fear not, Jacob, my servant. Jacob reminds us of the costly disciplines by which Jacob became Israel. In a sense, Jacob's story was almost a kind of preview of the, whole, of the story of his people after all, in exile in Mesopotamia, the same place that these people were, were going to go to now, then returning and so on, then, back, then in Egypt, and but finally at the end of his life, seeing that God, like his son Joseph, that God had meant it for good. Now, I say good news after bad news. The bad news comes first, the negative before the positive. Time of distress. Verse 7 is a time of distress for Jacob, yet he shall be saved out of it. Now, when does this time come? I think you have to remember what I said already about prophecy. This is not just one time of distress. This is not just the time of distress of Jeremiah's day of the exile. It's the time of distress later on when they, throughout the whole history of God's people, time of distress, time of judgment. And in different ways, this is true of every generation of God's people. It is a time of distress, a time of trouble. And, and remember, Jeremiah is a poet. And as a poet, he uses imagery 
and sometimes fairly extravagant imagery to make his point. Nowhere more so than here. Verse 6, ask thou and see, can a man bear a child? Why then do I see every man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor? Why has every face turned pale? And he uses here the imagery of the pain of childbirth. I think the point he's making here is that these are the pains ultimately of life, not of death. And I think Paul picks this up in Romans chapter 8. When Paul is talking about the future the future time when the children of God will be like Christ, when creation will be redeemed. And he uses the metaphor there of creation, uh, groaning in the pains of childbirth. In other words, the present distress is going to lead to future life. That is the point that's being made here, and I think developed in, in Romans. And I think this is the point. What will happen is far, far bigger than the return of people to this piece of real estate on the eastern end of the Mediterranean, far more even than the salvation of God's people, wonderful as that is. What's going to happen is a whole renewed and restored creation. You see that particularly next week when we look at the new covenant. The whole of creation will rejoice. The whole of creation will, it will, wear, its, uh, will wear its wedding finery when the king returns. And there is a bright future for Israel. There is a bright future for God's people. There's also a bright future for the universe. But it's not easy. I mean, look at verse, um, look at verse 11. The end of verse 11. I will discipline you in just measure. I will by no means leave you unpunished. For thus says the Lord, verse 12, your heart is incurable. Now, this, it isn't the case that we're just going to go straight from where we are into the new creation, so to speak. There is a painful discipline on the journey. But notice, God retrieves the irretrievable, cures the incurable, verse 12. Your heart is incurable and your wound is grievous. There is none to uphold your cause, no medicine for your wound, no healing for you. Ultimately, only God can do this. In verse 14, your lovers have forgotten you. The lovers are the foreign nations with whom God's people made unwise alliances. That had begun long, long before in the times of the great Solomon himself. If you read that sad chapter, 1 Kings 11, where Solomon turns away from the Lord to foreign gods. And these nations are, are going to punish God's people. This was already happening in the time of Solomon. But when the judgment is over, God will forgive. You know, notice, notice twice, um, verse um, 9, sorry, verse 7, he shall be saved out of it. And then verse 11, I am with you to save you. Verse 17, I will restore health to you. Now, how is it possible? The reason it's possible is because ultimately it is not those foreign nations who have destroyed Israel. It is the Lord Himself who has brought judgment on His people. And because the Lord has brought judgment, the Lord is able to forgive. No mercy from Babylon, no mercy from Assyria, no mercy from the great, powerful, chilly, bleak forces of the world, but there is mercy from the Lord. That's why it's so important to have a proper understanding of the anger of God. Sometimes when people talk about the anger of God, they talk about it as if it was something like a live wire. If you touch a live wire, you'll be electrocuted. If you put your hand into the fire, you will be burned. Now, long ago, C.S. Lewis pointed out that was a very, very unfortunate metaphor because it is a metaphor as well. If we talk, we, the only way we can talk about the anger of God is by using metaphors and pictures. And Lewis says, what do you substitute by, so, so, sorry, what do you gain by substituting the, mes, the metaphor of a live wire for outraged majesty? Because a live wire cannot forgive. Outraged majesty can. And that is the point. 
It is the outraged majesty of God which will bring back his people. If the anger of God were like a live wire, they really are all finished. Every time we sinned, we would be justly condemned, and that would be it. But there is grace, there is mercy, and, that's the, and that is why, after the time of distress, there's the good news after the bad news. And the good news is that the true king will reign. Verse 9, for they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king. It's difficult to exaggerate the importance of David in Scripture. And very often the prophets, particularly Jeremiah and Ezekiel, will use the name David not just to refer to the great king of the past, but to refer to the one who is to come, the, the, the new David. But I think it's important to realize that in David's reign, there was a genuine glimpse of the coming kingdom in two ways. First of all, in David defeated God's enemies. All the land from the river Nile to the river Euphrates was conquered by David and reigned over by David. You read about this in 2 Samuel. And this fulfilled the promise to Abraham. Abraham was promised in Genesis 15, your descendants will inhabit this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. So it's a genuine glimpse of how one day David's son will govern the whole earth. There's also another genuine glimpse in David's kindness, particularly you read the story of Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson, Jonathan's son, whom David took into his own home and sat at his table. And this is all summed up in 2 Samuel 23 when David talks about just rule, which is like the sun shining in the morning or the rain falling on parched earth. So, in a genuine way, David's reign prefigured the kingdom that is to come, the new creation. But if that were all, it would just be nostalgia. Oh, can't we have another? This is not saying, oh, can we have another David? This is, this is pointing forward to, to a, a David who will be greater than any David of the past was. David's greater son, who would come in the middle of time and then again on the last day, who would himself bring in the final chapter of this story. So, David will, their king whom I will raise up for them. Ezekiel says a similar thing, Israel and Judah will return, and my servant David will reign over them. So, this is good news, which is preceded by bad news. The, the bad news is there to show us, really, that we can only make it by grace. If we think we can build the kingdom by our own merits, if we think by being just trying a little harder, the kingdom will come, and we're doomed to failure. The kingdom will come because the king will bring it. And thirdly, then, there's good news of the coming, developing this, there's good news of the coming kingdom, verses 18 to 22. In other words, what will the reign of David be like when David returns, when, the new, when the David's greater son reigns, what will it be like? Verse 22 is the key, you shall be my people and I will be your God. When Emmanuel comes, this is what it will be like. The first thing is God's original purpose will be fulfilled. Verse 6, sorry, 18, I will restore the fortunes of Jacob. Now, restore once again, don't misunderstand this, is God is going to do more than restore. He is going to bring something better. That's the end of the book of Revelation, the Lord says, see, I am making everything new. But going through, and this really is a kind of summary of the history of the, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob, reminding us once again the story of Jacob, uh, who lived in tents most of his life, the desert, and of course the people in the desert, and the city will be rebuilt. Um, once the city, verse 18, shall be rebuilt on its mound, the palace shall stand where it used to be. Now, that did happen when Ezra and Nehemiah and the pioneers returned. The city was rebuilt, the palace and the, and, and the temple. But it's far, far more than that. Look at, look at, the, look at verse um, 19 and 20. Out of them shall come songs of thanksgiving, 
and the voices of those who celebrate. Times of joy and celebration. Remember one of the pictures of the new creation is the image of a wedding, the image of the party, the image of joy and celebration. So the things that make life wonderful, the things that make life beautiful will resume. And in one sense, of course, that, that will happen when Ezra and Nehemiah return because the, the life of the city can take on some kind of stability. But surely it's one of the great pictures of the new creation, picture of festival, picture of rejoicing. And notice verse 9, I will multiply them, they shall not be few. Remember once again Revelation 7, a great multitude that no one could count. So God's original purpose fulfilled but better than, the, than, than Eden, better than the days of David, better than anything we experience on earth. Because in, in this, this, is simply the, this is simply the title page to the great story which goes on forever, which no one on earth has ever read. I'm not going to tell where that comes from. You can probably guess. Um, the great story has not yet begun. And the, the other thing about the coming kingdom is the king-priest will reign, one of themselves. The prince, verse 21, should be one of themselves, developed with the idea of David their king. He will be both king and priest. And that's only truly fulfilled in Jesus as he brings God to us and us to God. Since we have a great high priest, says the letter of Hebrews, let us come with confidence of the throne of grace. And in verse 22, what was always an ideal becomes true in reality. Now remember, this is always true from God's side. I am your God. You will be my people is only imperfectly true in this world. But in the world to come, it will be perfectly fulfilled from both sides. God will be God. The world will know it. God will be God and his people will be truly his people. Good news of the coming kingdom. See, Jeremiah in prison in the dying days of Jerusalem, surrounded by misery and terror and fear and apprehension, looks forward to this glorious time. And very briefly, the final footnote, verse, verses 22, sorry, verses 23 to 24. Good news for the future. And once again, in 23, and the first part of 24, there is a reminder that evil needs to be destroyed before the kingdom can come. If the evil things are allowed to grow and flourish and remain, the kingdom will never come. In the latter days, you will understand this. In the last days, you will understand this. Now, in one sense, that's true with the whole, when the whole canon of Scripture is completed. When we when we know about the cross, the resurrection, and the coming, not least in the book of Revelation, the two comings of Christ, the coming in the middle of time, which has already happened, and the coming, which is, which is still future. You will understand. Now, even in this world, we can understand enough to believe, to be forgiven, to become God's people. Without understanding everything, we can understand enough to understand enough to come to Christ, understand enough to, to, to live for Him. It will be fully true in the world to come. And as I, I referred already to 2 Peter chapter 1, you have this word of the prophets, which is like a light shining in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arises. Until the day, you see at the moment, how do we know that it's true? How do you know that somebody who is preaching the biblical gospel and somebody who is not, how do you know which one is telling the truth? Well, of course, we only know now by faith, don't we? But on that day, says Peter, when the light dawns, it will be obvious that this is true. It will be obvious that the kingdom has come. It will be obvious that the kingdom has come on earth as it is in heaven. It's not the book of consolation. This is not the second best this is not something we get if we, if we don't make a mess of it. This is the wonderful promise, which next week we're going to see 
enshrined in, in the new covenant. And it seems to me that this message of the future is the only message that will keep us going in the present. The more firmly we believe that Christ will one day come to destroy evil and to set up his kingdom, the more urgent it is that we engage in all lawful and worthy activities until he comes. That's what Jeremiah is saying to us. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the words of the prophets, the light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the day star arises in our hearts. Help us in this perplexing and murky and difficult and tangled world to walk in your ways, to follow the light until one day the darkness gone and the imperfection removed, we see you face to face. Amen. Now, our closing hymn will be on the screen, Come People of the Risen King, who delight to give him praise. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with shouts of joy, to the only wise God, 
be glory, majesty, and honor. May he walk with us through this world, surround us with his love, and bring us in the light of grace to the light of glory.